Jay in Midland, Texas, wants to know how the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, if it's related to the divine counsel. And he wants to know that because he read the study notes for the Faith Life Study Bible that the translation of the Shema is problematic Mm -hmm. and that there are five translation options for the verse. Thinking that you wrote the study note. I did. (laughs) You got him wondering (laughs) if possibly the Lord is one is somehow related to divine counsel concepts. Yeah, it it is. And I'm going to quote here from the Unseen Realm for this one. It's going to be on page 339, and the page 339 is what I'm talking about in the book is where James, the, the book of James, references the Shema. And so I'll, I'll just pick it up on page 339, and then there's going to be a footnote, and I'll read the footnote. So I wrote here, early in our study, when I introduced the Divine Council, I noted that the Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4, the theological creed of Israel, was worded in such a way that the existence of other gods was not denied. And the quote is, the Lord our God is one. And that the, you know, just rabbit trailing here. That that part's clear. The reason why there's five different translations uh, translation options for Deuteronomy six four is that there are no verbs in the verse. Okay, that that that's what makes it notoriously difficult. But what is clear is it says the Lord our God is one. So the the reality of other gods is not denied, and elsewhere in Deuteronomy they're actually going to be affirmed. Okay, Deuteronomy four, Deuteronomy thirty two, all that. Continuing on with what I wrote here, Paul's wording in First Corinthians eight has the same feel. In fact, most scholars believe that Paul specifically has the Shema in mind. This is where Paul says, you know, for us there's you know for for others there are you know many gods, many lords, but for us there is one. You know, one Lord, one God, all that stuff. Now, here's the footnote. This footnote number nine on page 339. And it's it's a fairly lengthy one, but I'm going to read the whole thing. James also has the Shema in view when he writes, quote, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder, unquote. That's James 2.19. Now, note that James does not say the demons believe in God and therefore tremble. What he says, that this verse is often misread, what he says is that they believe that God is one, and that's what frightens them. Now, a fundamental theological point of the Shema was that God had offered redemption to and through only one nation and community, Abraham's descendants. Israel had been created by supernatural intervention after God had disinherited the nations of the earth, Genesis 10, at the Tower of the ba- Tower of Babel event, Genesis 11. Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, a passage at which we've looked at many times in the book, in the Unseen Realm. When he divided mankind, God fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Now, after the judgment at the Tower of Babel, God called Abraham... Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And these two events are juxtaposed back to back. When God called Abraham and promised the creation of his portion, the nation of Israel, through Abraham and Sarah, he disinherited all the other nations, allotting them to the other heavenly beings, the sons of God. Those divine beings are elsewhere referred to as the host of heaven, the gods, Elohim, and quote unquote demons, the Shadim in Deuteronomy. You have Deuteronomy 4, 17, 29, 26, 32, all those chapters. Old Testament theology, I'm continuing with a footnote here, Old Testament theology puts these sons of the Most High, Psalm 82, 6, under judgment for not ruling justly and seducing the Israelites to worship them instead of the one true God. There are two important theological points related to the Shema in all of this that touch on James 2.19. First, all the people of the nations under the dominion of lesser Elohim were outside the plan of salvation. A Jewish follower of Jesus, in other words, the audience of the book of James, according to James 1, 1 through 3, knew and rightly affirmed the Shema. Their faith in Jesus did not nullify the creed that the Lord our God is one, since Jesus was the incarnate Yahweh. After the event of the cross, Abraham's seed was all believers, Jew and Gentile together, Galatians 3. So believing God is one was still an expression of faith for a Jewish follower of Jesus that there was only one God who could provide salvation, and he had done just that through the work of Jesus. Second thought is that the rebellious sons of God also knew that that's what the Shema meant. It reminded them that they were under judgment, sentenced to die like men in Psalm 82, and forever banished from the presence of the true God. 
that is what frightens them, not the reality of God's existence. So that's the end of the footnote. So in other words, the Shema, you know, when, when, the, when, the, when the, the, the demons know that God is one and that scares them, it scares them because that statement means not only that there's one way of salvation, it also means that, there, that God is the God of all the nations. He is the God of all humanity, all the nations. And it's a reminder, the Shema, the Lord our God is one, is a reminder to the demonic powers that what they possess, their dominions, are going to be lost. They are going to be displaced. They are going to be judged. They are going to die like men. Okay, They understand that even though it isn't the case now, that everything is sort of subsumed under the God of Israel, as was originally intended. They know that ultimately this is where everything is leading. Israel is Yahweh's portion now. Yahweh is the God of Israel. But ultimately, ultimately, God will be the God of everything and everyone in the end. And so the, the fact that the Lord our God is one, even now under these circumstances, even when we you know, have, have dominion, even when we are, are free to do what we do in rebellion against him, the, the, the idea of the Shema, again, that everything will be subsumed under one God and all people, all divine beings, all nations are accountable to him. That's what freaks them out. So yeah, the Shema, uh, again, filtered in this case, as I've answered the question, filtered through James, is part of the divine council worldview. And again, in, in this case, the, the, the trajectory I took here, uh, if, you're a, if you're one of the gods who are in, in rebellion, it, it frightens you for that reason, because it's a promise. It's not just a statement. It's a promise of things to come, as well as an ideal of what should be. And that, that dispels their doom.